Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 45. In this lecture, we'll discuss thermal conduction and radiation. These topics are covered in Chapter 20 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. In the last few lectures, we've discussed heat or the transfer of thermal energy at length. However, we weren't very specific about the exact mechanism for the transfer of that energy. It turns out there are three basic mechanisms for heat which we need to now discuss. The first of these mechanisms is called thermal conduction. In thermal conduction, energy is transferred through particle collisions. So thermal conduction involves physical contact between two objects, allowing the molecules or atoms of one object to collide with the molecules of the other object, and in those collisions, energy is transferred from one object or system to the other one. When you're heating a pot of water on the stove, you're using thermal conduction. In that case, the hot air molecules inside the flame collide with the aluminum atoms of the pan, and then those aluminum atoms collide with the cold water molecules inside the pan, and through this series of collisions, energy is transferred heating up the water. When you jump into a swimming pool to cool your body, once again, there's physical contact and you're using particle collisions to transfer thermal energy. Another mechanism for heat is thermal radiation. In this case, energy is transferred through the emission or absorption of electromagnetic waves. We've discussed electromagnetic waves in previous lectures, light, microwaves, radio waves, X-rays and ultraviolet rays are all examples of electromagnetic waves. We know that electromagnetic waves carry energy and when an object or a system emits electromagnetic waves, it's basically losing energy and when it absorbs electromagnetic waves, it's basically gaining that energy. When you heat a cup of water in the microwave oven, you're using thermal radiation. In that case, there's really no collision but the H2O molecules in the cup of water are basically absorbing the energy of the microwaves, which are electromagnetic waves. The heating of the Earth by the sun is also an example of thermal radiation. There's obviously no direct collision between the Earth and the sun. The Earth and the sun are separated by the vast vacuum of outer space. However, the sun manages to uh, heat the earth through thermal radiation. The sun emits a large amount of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. Some of that energy reaches the earth and it heats the earth up. Another mechanism for heat or the transfer of thermal energy is called convection. In this case, energy is transferred through large scale motion of matter. So convection involves large numbers of particles moving from one place to another, and as they move or as they migrate, they carry thermal energy with them. So there doesn't have to be any electromagnetic waves, there doesn't have to be any collisions, but there needs to be large-scale motion of matter. Convection is responsible for the circulation of air currents in the Earth's atmosphere. So the winds that blow through the atmosphere are basically displacing large amounts of air. And as they do that, these air molecules are carrying large amounts of thermal energy with them. When you cool your body by sitting in front of a fan, for example, again, you're taking advantage of convection. The fan is essentially creating a stream of air, and that stream of air carries energy away from your body, thereby cooling your body. In the remainder of this lecture, we'll discuss thermal conduction and thermal radiation at depth. However, we will not get into convection for this class. For this class, you only need to know the concept of convection. However, we won't be doing any precise calculations with convection. Our focus will be on the first two mechanisms for heat. Of the three mechanisms for heat, thermal conduction is probably the most common. Thermal conduction is the transfer of molecular kinetic energy through collisions. This is essentially the mechanism we've had in mind for most of our discussions about heat so far, but of course it's not the only mechanism.
For thermal conduction to happen, there needs to be physical contact between two objects, allowing the molecules of one object to collide with the molecules of the other object, thereby transferring thermal energy. If the two objects are at the same temperature, then we say they are in thermal equilibrium. In that case, there is no transfer of thermal energy. So thermal conduction happens when one of the objects is hotter at a higher temperature than the other object. In that case, for a deeper understanding of thermal conduction, we need to focus our attention on the boundary between the two objects. It's at this boundary that the collisions are actually happening. So for a quantitative understanding of thermal conduction, we need to zoom in on this boundary and describe some of the physical characteristics of the boundary between the two objects. In most cases, we find that the two objects are separated by a boundary, a partition, or a wall of some kind, and we'll describe the area of that wall by the letter A and the thickness of that wall by delta X. The temperatures of the hot and the cold objects on the two sides of the wall will be referred to simply as T sub H and T sub C. The flow of energy through the wall from the hot object to the cold object is dictated by the law of thermal conduction. According to this law, power is equal to some constant K times the area of the wall times the difference in temperature divided by the thickness of the wall. P stands for power. It is the rate of energy flow. It's the thing that tells us how much energy is flowing through the wall per second. K is the thermal conductivity of the material. It's also known as the coefficient of thermal conduction. It depends on the substance or material of the wall. So some materials are good thermal conductors and some are bad thermal conductors. I'll tell you much more about that on the next slide. A is the area through which heat, heat flows. So A is essentially the cross-sectional area of the wall. In this picture, A is simply this area. Delta T, of course, is the difference in temperature. We can express that as T hot minus T cold. And of course, delta X is simply the thickness of the wall. Notice that the law of thermal conduction is telling us that if the wall is very thick, then the amount of energy that flows through it is going to be smaller. That makes sense. A thicker wall would present better insulation. The law of thermal conduction also tells us that if the area is large, so there is a large area of contact between the two objects, then the amount of energy that flows through the wall is going to be larger. The rate of energy flow also depends on the difference in temperature. So if the two temperatures are equal to each other, then no heat will flow. On the other hand, if one of the objects is very cold and the other object is very hot, then there's going to be a large rate of energy flow. Note that the law of thermal conduction is often written with absolute value signs. That's because in this context, when we talk about power, we'd like to talk about a positive quantity. However, in some applications, you may have to add a plus or a minus sign to this equation manually, depending on the type of calculation you want to do. You have to understand that when we say the power is 10 watts, what we're saying is that the hot object is losing 10 watts of power and the cold object is gaining 10 watts of power. So for the hot object, power is minus 10, but for the cold object, power is plus 10. For a better understanding of the law of thermal conduction, you need to recognize that P or power tells us how much thermal energy or heat is flowing through the wall per unit of time. So you can express P as Q, which is heat, divided by delta T, which is a time interval. You can see the same thing by looking at the unit for power. When I place square brackets around the quantity, I'm talking about the unit for that quantity, not its numerical value. The SI unit for power is the watt, which of course can be expressed as a joule per second. 
So P really is telling us how much energy or joules is flowing through the wall per unit of time or per second. This is important because in some applications you might be interested in the total amount of thermal energy that is flowing through a boundary between two objects. In that case, you can calculate P using the law of thermal conduction. And then once you've calculated P, you can set that equal to Q divided by delta T. You can then multiply that quantity by the uh, time interval of interest, and you can find the total amount of energy that is transferred between a hot object and a cold object. You also need to recognize that the thermal conductivity of the material is important. K tells us how good the material or substance of the wall is at conducting heat. The SI unit for K is the watt per meter per degree Celsius, although in many applications you can replace degree Celsius by Kelvin and you would still get the right answer. Remember that a change in temperature on the Kelvin scale is always equal to a change in temperature on the Celsius scale. That's because those two temperature scales have the same increments. Here are some examples of the thermal conductivities of some interesting materials. Note that copper is a very good thermal conductor because it has a high K value. Styrofoam, on the other hand, is a very bad thermal conductor, so its K value is quite small. Note that a good thermal conductor can also be described as a bad thermal insulator. Styrofoam, for example, is a bad conductor, but a good insulator. The words conductor and insulator, of course, are antonyms. They have opposite meanings. Which one you use depends a little bit on the application that you have in mind. Sometimes you want to maximize conduction. Sometimes you want to maximize insulation. In computer applications, for example, you might be interested in cooling down a CPU or a GPU by carrying thermal energy away from it. In that case, you may want to use copper for the thermal conduits. That's the situation in which you're mostly interested in maximizing conduction. In construction or building applications, you might want to build a house and you may want to insulate the interior of the house from the cold weather conditions on the outside. In that case, you want to maximize insulation. You probably don't want to build a house from styrofoam because it doesn't have much structural integrity. So you may want to use brick to build a house. Bricks are relatively good insulators. In discussions of thermal conduction, the thickness of the wall is of course quite important and the thermal conductivity of the wall's material is also quite important. Since both of those parameters are quite important, it's common to combine them into a single variable known as the R value. We can then express the law of thermal conduction in terms of the R value. Originally, we expressed the law in this form, but of course we can move the K into the denominator and then express delta X divided by K in terms of the R value. So the law of thermal conduction can now be expressed a little more concisely by saying that power is equal to area divided by the R value times the difference in temperature. It turns out the real utility of the R value is seen when we're dealing with situations that involve multiple insulating layers. When we're dealing with situations when something hot is separated from something cold by multiple walls. For example, the hot object might be your body separated from the cold outside air by three layers of clothing. Or the hot object might be the interior of your home separated from the cold outside air by three layers of insulation in the walls of your home. The walls of your home might consist of a brick exterior wall and then some fiberglass insulation and then drywall on the inside. In situations like that, the power that flows from the hot object to the cold object is given by this formula here. As you can see, the law of thermal conduction doesn't change much when you use the R value. 
before we had delta t, and here again we have delta t. We are assuming that all the walls have the same area, and so area shows up in both of these equations. The only thing that has changed is the r value. When you have multiple walls, you simply add the r values for all those walls to find the total r value. Of course, you do have to calculate the r value for each wall separately. So the r value for the first wall would be the thickness of that wall divided by its thermal conductivity. And then you would calculate the r value for the second wall in a similar manner. And you would keep doing this for all of the walls all the way to the last, let's say the nth wall. Once you've done that, then you can substitute that total r value into this formula and you find the power that must be flowing through all of those walls. Now I should mention that this power is often referred to as the steady state power. So when thermal conduction first begins, the power that passes through these walls may not be this value, but if you wait a few minutes and allow the power to stabilize um, when you have a steady flow of energy, then that power is given by this formula. So if the three layers here are your clothing, when you first walk outside of your home into cold air, the power that flows through your clothing might be greater than this number here, but after a few minutes, once the power has stabilized, then the steady state flow can be described by this equation here. Let's do a practice problem now with thermal conduction. Consider a cubicle building with sides of length 5 meters. The walls are made of concrete with a thickness of 0.2 meters and thermal conductivity of 0.8 watts per meter per Celsius. The temperature outside is 0 degrees Celsius, while the temperature inside is 20 degrees Celsius. How much energy must the heating system provide in 12 hours to maintain the inside temperature constant? Assume heat cannot escape through the floor. So what we have here is a pretty boring cubicle building with sides of length 5 meters. All the walls of this building are made of concrete with a thickness of 0.2 meters, and the thermal conductivity of concrete is given to you as 0.8. The temperature outside is relatively cold at 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature inside is relatively warm at 20 degrees Celsius or approximately 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Since the inside is much warmer than the outside, the building is going to lose thermal energy. So thermal energy will flow from the inside through the concrete walls to the outside world. As the building loses energy, its temperature is going to go down. If we want to maintain the temperature constant, we have to turn on a heating system. The heating system essentially has to replace any energy that the building naturally loses through the walls. We want to calculate the amount of energy that the heating system must provide in 12 hours. This essentially amounts to figuring out how much energy the building loses in 12 hours, and then the heating system must essentially replace that energy. We're going to assume that heat cannot escape through the floor. So the building is cubical, which means it has essentially six faces, but thermal energy can flow only through five of those faces. We're going to assume that the floor is very well insulated by the ground. To begin with, we want to calculate area. Each face of the cube has a length five, so the area of each face of the cube is going to be 25 square meters. We're going to multiply that by 5 because energy can escape through only 5 faces of the cube. It cannot escape through the floor. That means that the total area through which thermal energy can flow is 125 square meters. We can now substitute that number into the law of thermal conduction. K is given to us as 0.8. The area is 125. The difference in temperature between the outside and the inside is 20 degrees Celsius, and the thickness of the walls is 0.2. Substituting those numbers, we find that the power is 10,000 watts.
This means that this building will lose 10,000 joules of energy every second to the outside world. The heating system must therefore replace 10,000 joules of energy every second. How much energy do we lose over a 12-hour period? We can now calculate the power by time. Hours is not an SI unit, so we must convert 12 hours to seconds. That amounts to 43,200 seconds. We'll multiply that time by the power, and we find that the total energy that the building loses, or the total energy that the heating system must provide, is 4.32 times 10 to the 8th joules. The second mechanism for heat is thermal radiation. To understand thermal radiation, you need to understand that the atoms and molecules of all objects, even relatively cold, solid objects, have a certain amount of microscopic motion. This microscopic motion of the atoms or molecules results in the acceleration or agitation of charges, that is the electrons or protons inside the atoms. These accelerated charges then emit a certain amount of electromagnetic waves, and the electromagnetic waves are then referred to as thermal radiation. All objects emit thermal radiation, but the frequency and intensity of the thermal radiation depends on the object's temperature. Roughly speaking, the hotter the object is, the more thermal radiation it will emit and the higher the frequency will be. You've probably seen this thermal radiation in some cases. Molten lava, a burning coal, or a red-hot piece of metal are all emitting thermal radiation. The red glow that we see is essentially light that is being emitted by the agitated charges inside these materials. The frequency or the color of the light that is emitted tells us something about the temperature of these objects. And of course, if we raise the temperature, the intensity or the brightness of the light also increases. Now, it turns out relatively cold objects also emit radiation. For example, the human body also emits thermal radiation, but we don't always see it because the human eye is not sensitive to the frequencies that these low temperature objects are emitting. If you use a thermal imaging camera, on the other hand, you can clearly see that the human body does emit a certain amount of thermal radiation. Thermal radiation in general is quite complicated in character, but we can calculate the quantity of thermal radiation relatively easily. More precisely, the power radiated by an object at temperature T is given by Stefan's law shown here. In this equation, P is the rate of energy emission. So it's basically the amount of energy per unit of time that is emitted by the object. It's measured in watts or joules per second. Sigma is known as the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's an important universal constant and its value is given here. A is the surface area of the object. So if you have, let's say, an iron rod uh, in the shape of a cylinder and you want to know how much power it's emitting, you would have to calculate the surface area of a cylinder to substitute into this equation. The number in front, E, is the emissivity of the material. Different materials or different substances emit different amounts of radiation. This table here shows some examples of emissivities for different substances. Copper has a relatively low emissivity, which means it emits relatively small amounts of thermal radiation, but asphalt has a relatively high emissivity, so it emits much more thermal radiation than copper or aluminum. I'll tell you more about emissivity on the next couple of slides, but for now, note that power is proportional to the fourth power of temperature. This means that as the temperature of something rises, the amount of thermal radiation that it emits rises very rapidly. If you double the temperature of something, 
you're not just doubling the amount of thermal radiation it emits, you're increasing that power by a factor of 16 or 2 to the fourth. To use Stefan's law effectively, we need to understand emissivity a little bit better. It turns out emissivity is related to the optical properties of media. To understand that better, imagine that electromagnetic waves are incident on the boundary between two media. So you can imagine that a beam of light is incident from air onto water or from air onto a piece of aluminum, for example. It doesn't really matter what the two media are. We only need to know that they have indices of refraction N1 and N2. Now, when this beam of light arrives on the boundary, some of it is going to be reflected and some of it is going to be transmitted into the second medium. Imagine that we can measure the amount of energy that is incident and the amount of energy that is reflected. More precisely, we want to measure the incident power, that's the amount of energy that is incident per unit of time, and we also want to measure the uh, power that is reflected. In general, uh, the reflected power will depend in a very complicated manner on the two indices of refraction, but we don't want to get into that discussion right now. For now, we'll just assume that these two powers can be measured, and we're going to define a new variable r as the ratio of these two powers. More precisely, the ratio of the reflected power to the incident power is known as reflectivity. So the reflectivity basically tells us what fraction of the incident power is reflected. In principle, we can also measure the amount of energy that enters the second medium. Let's refer to the power that is transmitted into the second medium as the absorbed power. We can then define a new variable A as the ratio of the absorbed power to the incident power. Variable A is known as the absorptivity. Absorptivity basically tells us the fraction of power that is absorbed uh, relative to the incoming or the incident power. Incidentally, notice that in this context, when I speak of the absorbed beam or absorbed power, I'm basically referring to the transmitted or refracted beam. So in the context of optics, it's common to refer to this beam down here as the refracted beam because it changes its direction or the transmitted beam. But in this context, we'll just refer to this beam as the absorbed beam. It's absorbed because it's simply not present in the original or first medium. Now we demand conservation of energy. And what that means is that we expect that the power that is reflected plus the power that is absorbed is equal to the power that is incident. There's basically no other option. If 10 joules of energy per second are incident on this boundary, some of it is reflected, some of it is absorbed, and those are the only options. So if, for example, three joules per second are reflected, then seven joules per second must be absorbed. What this means is that the reflectivity plus the absorptivity must equal to one. In other words, the fraction of power that is reflected plus the fraction of power that is absorbed must equal to 100%. This last equation is going to be important for our subsequent discussion. The emissivity of a substance determines how much radiation that substance emits at a given temperature. So we can define emissivity as the power that is radiated by an object divided by the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, divided by the surface area of that object, divided by the temperature of that object raised to the fourth power. This definition, of course, just comes from Stefan's law. Earlier, we expressed Stefan's law in this form. By rearranging this equation, we can arrive at this convenient definition for emissivity. Now, emissivity depends in a very complicated manner on the atomic and molecular properties of the substance. We don't really want to get into that discussion here. What's more important for us 
is that emissivity is related to the optical properties that we were just discussing on the previous slide. Recall that reflectivity is the fraction of incident energy that is reflected, while absorptivity is the fraction of incident energy that is absorbed. By conservation of energy, we expect that R plus A must equal to 1, so we can express A as 1 minus R. Although I won't prove it here, it turns out emissivity is related to these optical properties. More precisely, emissivity is equal to absorptivity, which is equal to 1 minus the reflectivity. This equation is quite important for us because in many practical situations, it's relatively easy to measure the reflectivity of a substance. In that case, we can easily calculate its absorptivity, and from that, we can easily calculate its emissivity. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, if emissivity is always equal to absorptivity, why don't we just eliminate E and deal with only one variable? The reason is that these are conceptually distinct ideas. A refers to the optical properties of the material, while E is describing thermodynamic properties of the material, it's ultimately related to heat and thermal radiation. So although numerically they are equal to each other, it is useful to treat them as two distinct and separate variables. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem on thermal radiation. Gas at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius is insulated from thermal conduction inside a cubicle glass box of volume 27 cubic meters. Thermal radiation may pass through the glass to heat or cool the gas, but conduction cannot affect the gas. The emissivity of the gas is 0 0.3. For part A, calculate the power that is radiated by the gas. So in this problem, we have 27 cubic meters of gas at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. The gas is confined to a cubicle box. We're going to assume that the glass walls of that box are thick enough that the gas is insulated against thermal conduction. What that means is that collisions cannot transfer thermal energy in or out of the gas. However, the walls of the box are made of glass and electromagnetic waves can pass through glass, so the gas could lose or gain energy through thermal radiation. In this problem, we want to just calculate the power that is radiated by the gas. For that calculation, we'll need the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, which is 5.670 times 10 to the minus 8th watts per square meter per kelvins to the fourth. Next, we'll need Stefan's law. According to Stefan's law, the power that is radiated by some object or material is equal to the emissivity times the Stefan-Boltzmann constant times the area of the object times its temperature to the fourth. Notice that the volume of the box is given to us as 27 cubic meters. Since the box is a cube, that means each side has a length of 3 meters, which means the area of one face of this cube is 9 square meters. Multiplying that by 6, we find the total surface area of the box to be 54 square meters. Notice also that the temperature of the gas is given to us in degrees Celsius. We must convert that to Kelvin. Note that Stefan's law involves temperature and not a change in temperature. This temperature here must be in degrees Kelvin, so I've converted 50 degrees Celsius to 323.15 Kelvin. We should also remember to raise that to the fourth power. Substituting those numbers in, we find that the power that's radiated by the gas is 10,015.76 watts. Continuing the same practice problem, for part B, suppose a temperature of the environment is 30 degrees Celsius. Calculate the net power loss by the gas. 
So this calculation is going to be a little more complicated. Here by the environment, we basically mean everything else outside the box. So the air surrounding the box, the table on which it's sitting, pretty much the rest of the universe will be treated as the environment. Now in the previous part of this problem, we found that the gas is going to be radiating away a certain amount of energy. But of course, the environment, that is everything around the glass box, will also be emitting radiation, and some of that radiation is going to be absorbed by the gas. So the gas is both losing and gaining energy. For this problem, we want to calculate the net power loss by the gas. We know that the temperature of the environment is 30 and the temperature of the gas is 50, so we expect overall for the gas to lose energy and the environment to gain energy, but we want to know precisely what that net power loss is. To see the situation a little more clearly, let's treat the environment and the gas as two separate systems. And let's take a close look at what happens when these two systems interact. To begin with, the gas is going to emit a certain amount of power. We'll refer to that as the power radiated by the gas. The power that's radiated by the gas is going to be partially absorbed by the environment and partially reflected by the environment. So some fraction of the energy will be reflected and some fraction will be absorbed by the environment. Of course, everything emits thermal radiation. What that means is that the environment is also going to be radiating some power. Of that power, some fraction of it is reflected by the gas and some fraction is absorbed by the gas. If we want to figure out the net power loss by the gas, we need to basically consider the total of all of these effects. To begin with, we'll assume that the environment absorbs all energy. This is a reasonable assumption because the environment is basically everything else outside the box. The energy really has nowhere else to go so we conclude that the environment must absorb any energy that is incident on it. When we say the environment absorbs all energy, what we're saying is that the absorptivity of the environment is 100%. Now recall that A equals E, therefore the emissivity of the environment must equal to 1. This allows us to use Stefan's law to calculate the power that's radiated by the environment. According to Stefan's law, the power is equal to the emissivity of the environment times the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the area through which thermal energy can be transferred times the temperature of the environment raised to the fourth power. Here I've converted the temperature of the environment to Kelvin. Plugging those numbers in, we find that the environment radiates approximately 25,856 joules of energy per second or 25,856 watts. Now this is the power that's radiated by the environment. The gas will absorb some of this energy. We are told that the emissivity of the gas is 0.3 and we recall that E equals A, so the absorptivity of the gas must be 0.3 as well. This means that the gas is capable of absorbing 30% of any energy that is incident on it. So the power that is absorbed by the gas is going to be 30% of the power that is radiated by the environment. So 0.3 times 25,856 tells us that the gas absorbs approximately 7,757 watts of power. Now we're interested in the net power loss, so we need to effectively add the two numbers that we've calculated. In part A, we found the power that was radiated by the gas. Here we found the power that is absorbed by the gas. We look at the difference of these two numbers and we find that the net power loss is 2,258.69 watts. Notice that we're looking at the difference because one of these represents a loss of power, that's the radiated power, and one of these represents an absorption or gain of power. If you want, you can also say the net power transfer 
is minus 2258.69 but since the question specifically asks for the net power loss it's customary to quote this number as a positive number and that is the end of this lecture thank you for your attention